I'd like to call this meeting to order. In accordance with the open meeting law, I'd like to announce that this meeting is being recorded and is anyone in the audience recording this meeting? Uh, hearing none, I'd like to call the rise from the Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, the first order of business today is the reorganization of the board, um, given that it's the first meeting after the annual elections. So this is our, our procedure. And as such, I would like to open the nominations for chair. And I'd like to ask if there are any nominations for chair. I'd like to nominate Doreen Goodrich again for chair for the upcoming year. Do I have a second on the nomination of Doreen Goodrich for chair? Second. Do I have any other nominations for a chair? They're hearing none. The nominations are now closed. Uh, I'd like to take a roll call vote now. Uh, Mr. Holstrom? Yes. Mrs. Brotherton? Yes. Mr. Simonian? Yes. Mr. Grossman? Yes. Mrs. Goodrich? Yes. For a vote of five to one, uh, Doreen Goodrich has been elected chair. Congratulations, and I thank turn you. the gavel back to you. Thank you so much. And thank you, board members. Yes. <clears throat> At this time, I would like to <laughs> open nominations for vice chair. I'd like to nominate Bob Grossman for vice chair. Yes. The, um, Mr. Grossman has been nominated and second. Are there any other nominations? I'll close nominations. And I'll call the roll, Mr. Holstrom? Yes. Mrs. Brotherton? Yes. Mr. Simonian? Yep. Mr. Grossman? Yes. And the chair votes yes. Congratulations, Mr. Grossman. Thank you. The next item of business is public comment, and signed up for public comment is Mr. Simonian. Um, normally, I would have waited till till the end, but um, <clears throat> there are some middle school kids who uh, have school tomorrow and need to get to bed. So, uh, just a couple of community things that I wanted to um, I wanted to bring to the town's attention. Um, this past Saturday morning, uh, there. The middle school, one of the teachers at the middle school, um, Mr. Sean Reed, he's a ELA teacher. He had organized an event. Um, and while most people were beginning their Memorial Day celebration weekend, uh, they had a great turnout of about 60 people who uh, ran in a road race that <coughs> he organized. Uh, <laughs> sorry, this, this is... Uh, a little emotional, but um, it was called The Last Mile, and it was dedicated to the um, people who didn't finish the Boston Marathon, the people who were victims of the Boston Marathon, and um, it was just a great community event. I, and I, I want to read part of the letter that <clears throat> he read to the, to the parents and, and the children and other teachers that participated. Because um, I think this is the kind of thing that, in our community, it, um, should go on. And uh, Mr. Reed, um, it runs a lot, runs in different marathons. And uh, the day after the marathon bombing, I think, like many of you, I was glued to the television, waiting to hear any new information. It was exhausting listening to the same recycled news segments, so I turned off the TV and decided to go for a run. This was a route I'd taken many times before, but this time it was very different and emotional. <clears throat> I had a lot of time to think about what transpired over the last 24 hours, and I realized I wanted to do something. I emailed Mr. Gagnon, who is the middle school principal, for those of you who don't know, and threw out a few ideas. What started out as a fun run quickly evolved into a full-fledged race to help remember the victims, honor the supporters, volunteers, organizers, and first responders. This run is also dedicated to the nearly 6,000 runners who were stopped short of completing the marathon because of the tragedy. So this is their final mile. And that was what the run was called, the final mile. And I, I just want to say one of the seventh graders actually designed a logo. And um, a couple of the people that they thanked was uh, Mr. Joe Estrella, who printed all the t-shirts for the run. And the uh, middle school cross country coach, Mrs. Murphy, who uh, volunteered her time to take the children out on the course a few times the week before the run so they would know the course and record all the finishers during the day. 
Um, and he closed his letter. Um, so today when you're out on the course, spend some time in thought. Think about why you're running. Think about those who lost loved ones that day. Think about those struggling to walk again and think about those who may never be able to walk again. Run for them, walk for them, and when you're done, go back and cheer each other on. Um, and I just, I, I wanted to bring this to the community's attention because I think this was a great thing. It was done within the middle school. Originally, it was open to just students. And then parents and teachers participated. So I, I just wanted to bring that to our attention. And, and the second thing is another community event. One of our Auburn residents, who was one of the 6,000 people who didn't um, finish the marathon that day, Kathy Lutz, um, every year she, um, she does what she calls the Jules Run. And it's to support, it's a road race to support um, Dana Farber. So um, I have one of the sheets with information I can leave for anyone who wants to get the web address and to get more information on it. But um, I just wanted to bring it up. I, it was a great event, um, some good community participation, and the kids were really enthused. Like I said, a lot of people were already starting their celebration, and uh, those people came out, gave their time, volunteered, and, and ran that last mile. So. Thank you, Mr. Simonian. Ms. Brotherton. Mr. Simonian, thank you for some positive news. Oh, thank you. Don't thank me. Thank Mr. Yes. Gagnon and Mr. Reed. Yes. Is that it, Mr. Simonian, mm -hmm. before I move? Thank you. Um, next, we have Mr. Michael Wade, who wants to... Lori? No, zoning, I'm sorry. Mr. Wade. I just felt it wrong. No, that's fine. Zoning, is that what it is? Yeah, it was zoning. Okay. My name is Michael Wade. I'm a business owner in the town of Auburn. I'd like to talk to the, about the zoning board, which I know is appointed by the selectmen, and I think there's some coming up this year. I'm not particularly sure when it's coming up, but I know there's openings there. I think it's, yeah, I wrote down, I think it's two seats are up, and I think judging by what I've seen in the zoning board, and I only know and I've gone quite a few times, in over quite a few years, starting I think from 2000 and no, I think 95 is when I first started going before the zoning board. You know, I, I what I see, okay, and this is my personal opinion, okay, I see people that sit on the board that appear to be anti-business, okay, and do it, do take do whatever they can to make it hard whenever you go before the board. I've yet to go in there where I go in one time. It's always two, two times, three times. I've gone back as many as four times. You know, you've got to remember business people. You have your lawyer there. You have your engineers there. You have everybody there that you're paying for. And the town needs businesses, you know, in other words, to keep the tax rate for the residents down, you need business. So you have to be business friendly. And I understand the people on the zoning board, just like all the people on the boards, you also still have to protect the town. That's, that's what they're there for, to understand the laws and that. But it's not to make it hard. If you fill in and meet that criteria, it's not to make it hard and then to joke about it later on, what's going on. You know, um, and I've seen when I've gone to the meetings and I've gone for myself, I've even sat in on some zoning meetings just to see how people are treated. And they do end up treating people differently. And I've seen it with townspeople going for, to get a variance on zoning and I've seen it with business people. They treat the people differently that go there and that's not right. The other thing what's going to happen is it's going to open the town up for lawsuits because people, everybody's supposed to be treated the same. It's not because you might not like this guy or what he's doing and stuff like that. In other words, you don't treat him any different than your buddy that's there, okay? Also, if you have somebody, and I've seen it when <clears throat> somebody might be in a butter, and realistically they should dismiss themselves, which they do, but they also should not be in the room. They should be dismissing themselves and go outside and not comment on what's going on. In other words, I think that's against the rules of the zoning. And I've seen it happen quite a few times. You know, and the other thing is, is, you know, you can look around. I don't know 
if, you know, people complain to the selectman or who they complain to, you know, town manager or whatever, you know, maybe check around and see the complaints that they've had on different people on the boards. In other words, maybe if you get the thing, maybe it's a time to make a change. I don't know. It's up to you people in that, you know, who gets, you know, appointed on the zoning board. But like I said, I've seen quite a few things and it gets frustrating after a while. And I know it probably gets frustrating for a lot of people that go to the zoning board. It's the one board they seem to have the hardest time with. And it shouldn't be. People on the boards are supposed to not make it easy for anybody, but they're supposed to obey the laws and follow through and treat, like I said, everybody with respect. And I don't see that. So, and basically that's all I wanted to say. I, don't, I know you guys got a full yeah. agenda here and I don't want to tie up anything, but I want to thank you for your time. I yeah. appreciate and, it. And, um, you know, it, I, I generally don't comment on citizens' comment, but if you ever have a concern, and it would be the same to this board, the planning board, or any other board, if you have a concern, whereas someone should have, you felt someone should have recused himself and yeah. or left the room, the, the place for that um, to be addressed is the Massachusetts Ethics Commission. Oh, no, no, I, I understand. Yeah, it, no, I'm just, you yeah. know, I mean, we, like, we, everyone is responsible for their own ethics issues and, yes. and are responsible for calling the Ethics Commission yep. to see if, if they um, need to take action. So um, if you ever felt that you had a concern, no, no, you that, could address that. And I appreciate your comments, your general comments, as opposed yep. to specific board members. Right. Thank you. Thank you. When, um, I can't remember from the last time we did an appointment for the zoning board, but um, commentary from the public is allowed at the yes. Mm -hmm. I, yes. I, I would I would just say, Mr. Wade, if, if you have specific examples that would be um, in, in comments that you'd like to make, that would probably be the best time to do it. What's that? We'll I, be making when, appointments when to the zoning board of appeals yep. in um, June. And so we do a lot, it is on the agenda and we do allow public comment at that time before we make appointments and you're welcome to come before the board and as Mr. Simonian said, give specific examples okay. at that time. But when, but, it, when is that? Um, we'll, we'll make you aware oh, of that. Okay, it's, make aware we of make all the appointments by the end of June. Okay, all right. Thank, Thank you. you, I appreciate it. The next item we have is a public hearing for Cumberland Farms, 502 Washington Street. We have a proposal to replace the existing underground storage tanks with two 20,000 gallon dual compartment double wall fiberglass tanks. Is there a motion to open the hearing? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The hearing is now open. Good evening and welcome. If you could give your name for the record and tell us a little bit about why you're here before the board. Thank you, my name is Paul Wilson. I work for Cumberland Farms. I'm a project manager in the planning department. Um, with me I have Phil Henry, the civil engineer from the civil design group um, for the project. As many of you are aware, um, we have an existing location on Main Street. It's actually um, 502, I'm sorry, Washington Street. And um, we're looking to raise and rebuild that facility as well as acquire uh, 82 South Street, merge the two lots, and uh, build a 4,500 square foot uh, Cumberland Farms um, as well as uh, five new fueling positions and um, two 20,000 gallon compartmented fuel storage tanks. Um, currently we have four uh, dispensers and um, they're in a sort of a stacked configuration. It's kind of hard to tell from this plan, but um, our new plan will our new plan will push the building further into the lot, mostly onto the new lot that we're acquiring on South Street, as well as um, 
have single dive islands here, which are uh, a better configuration for on-site circulation. So overall, we're, we're, we're taking everything pretty much from the site and starting over again. Um, the reason that um, we are here today is for our tank license. Currently, we have 22,000 gallons of uh, underground storage allowed to us. And like I'd mentioned before, we are looking to expand that to um, 40,000 gallons. Um, 24,000 gallons of which would be regular uh, fuel oil, uh, fuel gasoline, and uh, 8,000, well, I'm sorry, 12,000 will be um, premium, and then another 12,000 will be uh, diesel. So, um, could, could you tell us where you are at in the, um, the planning process? I know you've been before the planning board as well as the Zoning Board of Appeals. Absolutely. Could you let the board members know where you are in that process? Certainly. We, um, we have almost all of our approvals with the exclusion of this one and the building permit at this point. We did present to the um, Conservation Commission uh, back in December of last year. Um, and just as of last week, we did file for an amendment based upon some comments uh, we received from MassDOT. Um, they did vote to approve the, the amendment to that approval. Uh, we have our site plan review uh, approval from the planning board as well as the ZBA uh, approval for our, uh, our use. Mr. Grossman. Uh, I forgot when you were saying in the beginning the uh, pumps, I believe there's going to be, because I watched the, uh, the meeting before the, either the ZBA or the planning board, you're going to have one diesel uh, pump and the rest, the other nine will be premium or regular? Well, that, that's somewhat correct. One of the pumps, all the dispensers are multi-product dispensers. Um, the one, uh, pump farthest from it's either this one or this one, depending on which one we ultimately choose. Um, this will have not only the regular gasoline, but also the diesel. The rest will have the blending of the regular fuel. Okay, so there'll be a total of 10? It will be a total of 10 fueling positions, correct. And, okay, Mr. Simonian? Um, <clears throat> on what we have before us, it says that one of the tanks will be 8,000 gallons of diesel, and you said 12. I'm sorry, I, I did misspeak. Um, right, that that's is, fine. That is in, I was incorrect. It is 8,000 of diesel and 8,000 of premium. And so the existing tanks are being taken out? They will be taken out. They, they were uh, installed in 1994, I believe. Okay. And, um, and it, I, I can't tell exactly from this. It, they're going into the same place or are those are um, Roughly the, the same location, just a little closer toward the intersection. The existing okay. tanks today are somewhere around here. Um, and the new tanks will be, like I said, closer toward the intersection, still okay. within any setbacks. So the one that's the one that's circled in the corner on what we have, that's where the new ones are. Okay. All right. And um, is the, uh, you said you're tearing down the building, tearing out the pumps tanks is all the construction going to be contained to the site i the reason i ask is because i know that there's already some issues with traffic at that corner when mm -hmm. uh cars are pulling out onto south street so it, ha, has anyone addressed that up to this point is there do you know if there's going to be any issues has that been um brought up um there won't be any sort of massive off-site construction. I mean, we will have some utilities that we have to uh, deal with. Um, but there was, uh, as one of the conditions from, I believe, the zoning board, they had asked us to install a crosswalk here. Oh, okay. Um, so that is really the, the extent of our above and beyond the utilities, any off-site improvements that we were looking to do. Great. Thanks. So um, f members can see in their packet that Chief um, Coleman has signed off on this. I just wanted to let you know that I spoke with Chief Coleman today. He's actually at the board meeting next door, so he couldn't be here today. But he said, um, you know, when you're replacing old tanks, that 
don't meet the today's code requirements and you're meet and you're replacing them with tanks that do meet the requirements of 2013 that's a good thing and he fully supports replacing these tanks mr. Holstrom um, through the chair um, these tanks here they're located closer to the corner of Washington Street and route 20 now uh, where they're located now seems to be some sort of a traffic hazard and creates a little havoc there with uh, where those tanks are existing. Uh, the tanks that are going to be uh, located over in that corner, is that going to alleviate some of the traffic when the uh, supply truck comes in? Yes, absolutely, and that's a very good Again, question. Again, it kind of echoes what Mr. Smoney said about the, the traffic patterns over there. It is a very, very difficult corner and uh, you know, just kind of... With the construction, I understand, but uh, with uh, just refueling the tanks, you, uh, we want to try to alleviate that too. Understood, and uh, we did take that into consideration with our design. Um, it benefits us to have the tanker out of the way of our customers as well. So um, currently the tanks are here somewhere in the existing site, and they do get, the, when the delivery comes in, the tanker does block a lot of the traffic as well as a lot of our parking. Um, under this scenario here, you can kind of see the darker line is the travel path for the tanker. And he enters off of Washington Street, uh, positions himself over the tanks here, which are far away from any of the, the main access paths as well as any of the parking. Um, and once he's done fueling, he uh, loops around the, the, the uh, gas and back onto Washington Street. So at no time is he going to be stopping or uh, positioning in any majorly traveled or heavily traveled portion of the, the site. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Grossman. Madam Chairman, uh, one question uh, which people have asked, what is your expected downtime? Um, we like to be as, as, as soon as possible, but uh, realistically, four to six months. Four to six? Um, to follow up on Mr. Holstrom's um, concern, and many of us have heard concerns with the traffic, um, having watched the previous meetings, it's Cumberland Farms' intention to notify all of their vendors not to exit on the South Street it, it exit, is. And, and, it, and, it, you'll notif and Cumberland Farms will notify all of their vendors to exit on the um, Route 20? Correct. That is a part of our condition exit. of approval. Okay. So. We okay. must adhere so, to that. so that will address some of the concerns with the traffic that all of the vendors, whether it be bread vendors, um, soda vendors, the trucks coming in, will um, enter and exit on the Route 20 side. Are there any more board member comments or questions? Is there any public comment on this? Did you have anything else before we close the hearing? I do not. Okay. Motion to close the hearing. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So voted. Is there a motion regarding the application? Make a motion to approve the request provided that all applicable requirements of the state and town, any of its departments, boards, and commissions have been fulfilled. Said license is subject to all the conditions stated upon it. Failure to comply with any and all conditions shall invalidate the license and render it null and void. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed, so voted. Thank you for coming in. Good luck. Thank you all. Next item we have is our Solid Waste Advisory Committee report. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Amy Sullivan, the chair of the Solid Waste Advisory Committee. Um, we were asked to take a closer look at the solid waste budget, including um, estimated indirect costs to run the program. So we had um, many meetings and many discussions about the budget, and um, we have, based on several factors, we are supporting a fee adjustment at this time. The three main reasons are there has, no, there has been no fee increase in the trash and recycling collection since 2004. So the, the fee has been the same for almost 10 years. Um, the cost to dispose of trash at the incinerator, the wheel abrader, has increased by $2 per ton. Uh, that was since January 2012. So we're currently uh, paying $74.01 per ton. 
and in 2012 alone that was almost nine thousand dollars additional for the disposal um, our hauling contract includes an increase each year it's approximately 2.25 percent uh, that represents an annual cost of living increase for the drivers and an annual increase to pay for the cost of the new brown toters that we got um, in 2010 for the new two car program um, do you want me to continue so we do not support anything higher than um, it's approximately it ends up being approximately 12.5 percent it will result in approximately um, $12 for the large toters, uh, $24 annually, so $12 twice a year on the bill, and $10 per billing period for the smaller toters, and this would um, begin July 2013, so soon, um, to make the budget um, balance. And we looked carefully at the numbers. Like I said, we had, we had lots of discussions. We also have... Um, on the other side of that, we have a lot of things that are diverting tra um, materials from the, the tonnage, from the trash that's being disposed at the wheel abrader. Um, I don't know if anyone has noticed the new recycle bins we have at the parks. Um, we have uh, sports fields and town parks have recycling now for bottles and cans. Um, we have worked with surrounding towns to develop a regional reuse guide. It's on our website. It gives additional resources for hard to dispose of items, reuse options, and some companies that actually take back things. Um, we are continuing ongoing education and outreach, and we have new initiatives coming up, um, textiles recycling, and we're going to work um, to try to educate people on food scrap composting to try to keep that out of the trash. We, um, you'll hear later on about the hugely successful electronics take back program that the Board of Health facilitated. Um, so, about it, there's. Are, are you finished? Are you doing sure. a presentation? Is this? Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. We, we so presented the report, so I don't right. know if you want, okay. how much you want me to present or how much you want to no, ask uh, me. We'll just hear from Mr. Casanova okay. next then. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. I think I missed my cue when Amy <laughs> looked this way. Uh, before they gave their recommendation, um, um, I wanted to at least um, explain to the board the rationale behind their recommendation of 12.5%. Uh, provided to you was an analysis of, of expenditures and revenues for uh, the collection and disposal of trash. For the FY14 budget, roughly, not roughly, approximately $940,000 was appropriated uh, to meet those contractual obligations. Uh, we subtracted from that the value of the trash that is collected for all municipal buildings. That's roughly 8.39% or a total value of $78,892.26. That value was determined based upon the actual tonnage picked up at our municipal facilities for a one-year period beginning March of 2012 and ending February of 2013. In addition to that, the town hall personnel uh, and support costs in order to uh, support that activity is $218,555 as identified up in the left-hand corner of the page bringing total costs to support solid waste collection and disposal of $1,079,975.76. On the FY13 recap sheet, we projected, based upon prior actuals, a trash fee collection of $964,402. Roughly $1,616 was granted by way of abatements. That would leave a balance to break even raising uh, an additional, uh, raising the fee by 12.5% to come up with $117,189.76. Um, I think Amy had indicated that the fee had not increased in approximately 10 years. Um, we presented on a few occasions a, a similar analysis uh, that the board had asked for back in FY12 showing a total subsidy uh, of the town of 200 roughly $200,000 at that time that subsidy did not 
uh, segregate the collection from the municipal side of government. Um, the allocation methodology the used to distribute by department as well as retirement unemployment insurance bond is based upon the percentage of budget that the solid waste uh, department represents as part of the total budget. That's roughly 1.889%. Uh, so that was used as an allocation methodology in consideration for the town hall indirect cost in maintaining this activity. Uh, so with that, uh, we brought it before the Solid Waste Committee. We met several times, um, and uh, it was a unanimous vote to uh, make a recommendation to this board to increase the rate by 12.5%. Mr. Holstrom. One question through the chair. Uh, Eddie, I know that, that we have been approached several times with um, this coming forward in 2004. Yeah, it's been pretty good timing that we have not had had any increases. However, um, it, by just looking at the documentation we have tonight, it sounds like this is going to take place July 2013, so a couple of months. And we're going to turn around to the residents, taxpayers, saying, it's another fee. We've got another increase coming. Is there any way that we can uh, delay that until January or so to let the residents get accustomed to a new fee coming towards them? Uh, through the chair to Mr. Holstrom, we could do that, but that would mean roughly half of that 117000 we would have to find as another revenue source to make up that loss. Because when we presented the budget town meeting, we did anticipate a fee increase as part of our budget model. Um, so yes, it could be delayed, but we would have to identify uh, an additional roughly $60,000. Uh, the, uh, the thing I'm just thinking about is some of the um, senior residents, that uh, they are on fixed income. and. They are probably budgeted for this year, and now to have that additional, it is $12 for the, the first portion of it. I can understand that, but uh, that $12 for somebody that's on a limited budget uh, can be kind of uh, disheartening, and they want to be sure that, uh, you know, we can, if we can handle that, I'd like to uh, delay that one way or another, or let the residents know one way or another that that's coming. Uh, through the chair to Mr. Holtram. Um as part of the budgetary process, we try to do a analysis on all of our fees to make sure that we're recovering 100% of the cost to support that activity, whether it be sore enterprise, whether it be trash. Um, by not raising the rate, uh, that additional burden is assumed by the taxpayer of Auburn. Um, and they may not be getting the benefit of a trash collection program, uh, but certainly those dollars have to come from somewhere if the fee is not covering the cost to support that okay. that activity. Thank you. Mr. Simonian. Yeah, I, I have a couple of questions. Um, in your presentation, you mentioned that um, one, of the one of the cost increases was due to the additional toters that we ordered. Um, I know it's been a few years since we had the conversation about um, people who needed additional toters, but uh, I believe when that conversation was had that Part of the reason for doing it was that it wouldn't be an increased cost or burden, um, that there would be a benefit for people to uh, encourage them to do that additional recycling rather than if I filled my, if I filled my, my bucket, uh, now I'm just throwing everything in, into and with the trash because my recycle bucket's filled. Um, so it, it kind of seems like a couple of years later, now we're going the other way on that. Are you talking about the second recycle bin or the brown trash toters that we purchased from Central Mass Disposal back in 2010? I, I assume that's what you were talking about, the additional, when you said additional toters, because you didn't... Nope, the, um, the cost of the brown toters that we got with the new contract was built into that contract over five years, so we're still paying for those carts, so that the increase in the contract is... Um, part of the increase every year is for the cost of living for drivers, but also some of that is to pay for the carts. The brown trash carts that were new in 2010. So we, we pay a fee for the carts every year? 
Well, we spread it over five years so that it wouldn't be, it, they were very expensive, so we spread that over the contract, over the life of the contract for five years. That was how it was written. That's what we were asked to do back in 2010 when we were looking at, you know, what the contract fee would be with Central Mass at that time. It's, the brown toters are the larger ones for recycling, correct? No, no they're the trash. The trash. Brown trash. toters are for trash, so, so those are the new ones. What we had was the green, the large green toters, we had them at that time. We purchased smaller ones for the trash so that the, the two-cart um, system would work with single-stream recycling. Okay, right, and that, so that's, that's, that's exactly what I thought because part of that discussion was we were going to the smaller trash bin because people seemed to be buying into the single stream recycling, which was supposed to save money. And if they were doing that much recycling and needed a second toter, that it would ultimately save us money, not cost us more. And it has, and it has. Our trash tonnage has gone down significantly. Um, if we were still disposing of 96 gallons of trash every week and zero recycling, which was happening four years ago, we'd be looking at a huge increase in the fee. I mean, we wouldn't be looking at uh, $12 twice a year. It would have been a huge increase in the fee. I understand that, but, if, but part of the increase also was due to the tonnage. Now, so is that just a change in cost of what Whale Bray is charging us? Because it seems like it would be mitigated if we're actually sending less trash through there. It seems like that cost would work itself out. I'm going to have um, Mr. Kaznovich to the chair that. to Mr. Simone, and it has. Uh, but it, um, you got to remember, every year, um, Central Mass, as well as Wheeler Brader, um, has a, an index, a, a, an increase in price, ranging anywhere from um, 2 to 3%. So if you take 10 years of 2 to 3% increase on both collection and solid waste, the reduction in tonnage has offset that increase. Um, but it has now bottomed out, and those costs continue to uh, be applied uh, to both contracts, and we're not keeping pace with it anymore. So if you look at it over a 10-year period, 2 to 3% increase on both contracts, you're talking about a minimum 20% increase on the collection portion and a 30% increase at Whaler Breda. The cost of the reduction in trash helped mitigate that to a certain point, uh, and as we presented back in 2012, we outpaced that already because we were we weren't covering the cost back in 2012, and that continues to grow every year because now we've bottomed out. Basically, I think the statistics show uh, that we had a major reduction of about 15% when the single stream was introduced and applied, and for about a year and a half, two year period, it continued, but now it is bottomed out, and it's, it's, we're not seeing a further decline. Mr. Simonian. So, through the chair, Mr. Kevin, so, so we've, so, so we've realized all the savings that we're going to see from switching to single stream, single stream recycling. I hope not. I think there'll be more education, hopefully more outreach that will allow for a further reduction. But it's going to take some education. It's going to take some, um, um, you know, some work on behalf of the Solid Waste Committee to, to get the word out there to, to try to continue that effort. So, one last question. So if, if, we, if we get there... If, if, if all of those things do come to fruition and we see some additional savings beyond what, what we've bottomed out at in the coming years, would, could, would we then transfer that back to the, um, to the homeowners who are? Remember, this 12.5% increase is a break even. So it doesn't allow for any contractual increases we know are in place for the next two years. That being said, we're hoping to a further reduction in um, the tonnage, uh, increased recycling, less at the wheel, will mitigate those future in increases. But certainly, we will we'll keep an eye on it, and if it shows that we're making a profit, we have every intention of lowering that fee just to cover the cost. Mr. Smonian. Right, last question then. Um, so, kind of on, on the point that Mr. Holster made, um, and, and I know that it's not always easy to do, but if we as, as you said, o over that two-year period, we, we realized we were, we seemed to be bottoming out um, on that savings that we was talked about. I mean, that was even, I think, a year or so before I first got on the board. Um, maybe, you know, that kind of thing 
would have been able, we would have been able to put that out there sooner that there's probably going to be a fee maybe next year or something um, because this is where we're at with our savings on the single stream recycling. So we, we could have achieved what Mr. Holstrom is asking for possibly by, by looking ahead a little bit on that. Mrs. Brotherton. Any plans if the reverse happens, that if our residents decide that it's where they're going up on both both re the trash and recycling bins, that they just might say, okay, we're not going to bother with one of the bins, we'll just stick with the trash? Well, the problem with that is then the fee will continue to increase. I mean, the more trash we dispose of as a town, the more the bill is at the wheel abrader. The incinerator costs a lot of money, so that's why we're, we're doing these efforts to try to divert trash from that brown bin to the recycle bin to the, you know, um, textile bins that you see around town, the donations, the, the thrift shops, wherever sure. it goes, reuse, sure. reduce, <laughs> recycle. You know, we're just trying to, to get that tonnage down as much as possible. Um, it seems that the people who are recycling are doing a great job. There's still a lot of people who aren't recycling at all. So one thing we are recommending is to also, um, in line with that is to increase the cost of the overflow bags because okay. we see a lot of those around town every week. Um, it's, it's partially to um, cover the cost to actually dispose of what's in that bag because it seems like a, a dollar per bag is not covering the cost at the wheel abrader. We've estimated it's um, on average 93 cents okay. to bring that bag of trash to the wheel abrader and it costs a lot more than seven cents to generate the bag thank you amy i was just hoping our residents would, would see that the same way that so don't that get discouraged increase with the recycling exactly thank, thank you. you mr simonian on on that note since you brought that up I, um is there, is there a number that we could increase the cost of the trash bags to mitigate this cost and the rise of the toters? Because that seems to make a little more sense to me. If there are people, if, if the cost is going up because some people are not recycling, why not put that additional cost on the folks who aren't recycling and they're, and they're filling up those bags and, cre and, and increasing the tonnage um, rather than putting it on everyone? Because, as you said, there are people who are, are recycling. Um, so just a thought there. As you know, the uh, solid waste falls on the Board of Health right now. Um, identify yourself, please. I'm sorry. Mr. My name Pelletier. is Andy Pelletier. I'm the Director of Public Health. Thank you. Um, as Amy just mentioned, we're also recommending an increase in the overflow bags. What that does is shifts the burden on the people who are not recycling. Um, average households should be able to get their solid waste into the brown bins um, if you choose to go beyond that I don't think the town should be losing money on the per pound that you're putting in the blue bags so our recommendation is to shift some of the responsibility on the blue bag users um, I'm not saying stop using the blue bags blue bags are very convenient when you have large parties and big events but by increasing the price on the blue bags you are specifically targeting, as I believe the word you used, you're targeting those who are doing less recycling and choosing to go the easier route and, and use the blue bags. So our recommendation covers the cost of the blue bag, to produce the blue bag, to ship the blue bag, and also the cost to dispose of it at the wheel. Um, we're losing money on the blue bags right now at a dollar a bag. We're recommending that the price go to $1.50 to help essentially those people who are not effectively recycling and hopefully by increasing that dollar amount they will see the value in recycling and fill their recycle bin rather than their trash bins is, is that on here yes it's at the bottom and it should say the solid waste advisory committee recommends the cost increase I see the total right here. Right it's here. the second to last paragraph so I have um I have a follow up for either Mr. Pelletier or Amy um, on the blue bag on the blue bags. Have you, you know, and I know it's difficult to track. Have you ever done a study or tracked the blue bag usage? I mean, is it people consistent consistent consistently? Sorry about that. Using um the blue bags, or is it completely random? People having special events, holidays. I mean. I, I would think that it's the kind of, average homeowner isn't using blue bags for, you know, week after week. It's 
Sometimes I'll drive the trash routes before the mm -hmm. trash trucks do just to see what's going on out there. And consistently, I see blue bags at the same houses every time. Yeah. Other times, um, following a holiday or something, I see blue bags outside that I didn't normally see. I mean, I can't sit here and dictate. I'm not so familiar with the routes that I can dictate which houses. And But it's, it's a combination, but there are multiple houses, and I'll use the word multiple rather than some. There are many houses that consistently have blue bags outside. So I just want to be clear, does this proposed um, increase on the blue bags cover the cost? It covers the cost of the blue bags. It does not cover the $100,000 deficit that Mr. Kazanovich has referred to. I understand um, that, but... If it, we, we basically tried to identify the cost per pound based on 74 tons, I mean $74 a pound at the wheel, and that's this year's number. Remember, it's going up next year and the year after. Um, based on $74 a ton, I think it came to 72 cents $0. for a bag, Assume, yeah. assuming that a bag can hold approximately 20 to 25 pounds. Um, it comes to 93 cents. Add in the cost of producing the bag and shipping the bag, we felt that, I, I think the total came to like $1.20 something. We okay. felt that a nice round number of $1.50 would be fitting and also give incentives to hopefully try to get more recycling and, and reduce the number of bags. Okay, I just don't want to be back here next year saying that, the, you know, the cost isn't, the, the cost of the blue bag isn't covering the cost to dispose I of that blue bag. I will present to this board, I did a uh, quick survey of surrounding towns, and um, there is actually a <laughs> town out there that is charging $2, they strictly pay as you throw, mm -hmm. throw as you pay, um, pay as, as you, you throw, throw. and um, they charge $2.50 a bag. Okay. So I, I, I didn't want to match the highest number on the face of the earth, but I also didn't want to be below our costs. So the recommendation that I made to the... So, so do you believe looking, looking forward for two years or three years that the, that will cover the cost of disposing those bags? I mean, like I said, for 50 cents, I don't want to be back here in a year I, saying that it's not covering the cost I of the disposal. It, my original proposal to solid waste was that we set the bags at $2, that we double the price of the bags. And the reason that my attitude was on that was not just to cover the cost of the disposal of those bags, but I feel the bags and charging people for the extra tonnage is incentive to try to improve their recycling. So my original suggestion and opinion was to double the price of the bags and go to $2. Through debate with Mr. Kazanovich with the Solid Waste Committee, um, we, we felt that $1.50 would cover the cost for the next two years, which is the remainder of the contract with uh, Allied. Um, it may have to be revisited when we do the new contract. but. Um, the dollar fifty should, okay. considering two percent to two to three percent at the wheel, it should cover the cost of the disposal of the bag. Okay, so um, we're we're also talking about a user fee here for trash, um, and covering the cost of the user fee. All residents aren't required to be on the town trash system. Um, can either one of you just explain what the other options are for people who? choose not to be on the town system? There are several independent haulers that work in town. Um, Allied Waste has a, they're obviously the town contract. I, I don't think you would logically go to Allied Waste. It would cost you more. Um, Pratt could come into town. LaBeouf, K&G, there's a plethora of independent collectors in the town. Um, I did a survey. A lot of them don't work in Auburn, but I did a survey on what it costs for curbside collection. Um, I have got prices of $33 a month, $35 a month, um, essentially coming out to $396 a year, $420 a year, $488 a year, or $325 a year. I'd like to point out to the board that what we're proposing is that we increase our trash to the amount of 208 I believe, 216 a year. $25, $24 plus what we are paying now. So it's um, 90, 216. Huh? 216 is still a full third to almost a half. Um, one town is paying 488. Other towns that are on contract are paying close to what that is, $207 a year, $312 a year in, in one town that's on a strictly pay as you throw. Um, again, the town is charging 250 a bag is 
five hundred and twenty dollars a year if you if you if you interpolate that the containers can hold approximately four bags and obviously I have to assume that we can fill to capacity we're allowing them sixty five gallons so I ass so the assumption is that four dollars I mean four bags will give you the sixty five gallons approximately um, the town that's charging two fifty a bag is giving you a capacity for equal capacity that Auburn's given you they're charging five hundred and twenty dollars okay well over twice what we are suggesting so if any just to go back to my question if anyone has an, an issue with the proposed fees again they're not required to be on the town system what is the process do they if they have a private contract do they, do they provide proof to your department that they are legally disposing of their trash I guess that was my Maybe. question that people aren't required to use it but they are required to show that they're legally disposing of their trash there's a form that would have to be filled out from the assessor's office um, it is a alternate disposal form and if they fill that out and sign it it's signed them pains and penalties so we don't go looking for proof that they're that they found another one but if they state that they are uh, made a contract with Casella for curbside um, or they dump it at their place of business um, we accept them on their word okay um, we are very attentive to illegal dumping and the fines if we catch somebody doing that are significantly or will be significantly higher than the cost of having curbside pickup okay. mr. Smoney had something yeah I, I want to go back to this um, <clears throat> to the to the bags for a second because and, and I don't want I don't want to use the word target because it's not about targeting anyone but I do think that I, I do think that there should be some accountability and responsibility within the community and you had mentioned um, two dollars per bag instead of a dollar fifty so I guess my question is if we went to the two dollars instead of a dollar fifty could we then not increase the cost of the toters as much as what's proposed here because again I, I go back to as you said you drive the routes sp there are specific residences that are constantly using the blue bags week in and week out I think that you should bear the responsibility for that choice not to recycle it, rather than the whole town bear the responsibility. So I, I would be more in favor of increasing the cost of the bag because I, th I think your point is well made about, you know, it's a clear message that, you know, there is a cost for not recycling because the town has a cost for not recycling um, and put less of the burden on everyone else overall and more of the burden on the habitual users of the blue bags because I know I, we I I probably use them twice a year and that's and that's probably once in the summer and and around Christmas time and and you kind of alluded to that that there's people use them here and there and and I think Mrs. Goodrich also kind of made the same point so that's just my thought if if we could increase the bags to two dollars and it's specific to that group of people who are constantly using them and and not as much on the overall population of the town it seems to me to make a little more sense and put that responsibility on the folks who are using them all the time the original mission that I asked the solid waste committee to look at was to identify ways to either reduce costs or to increase revenues to cover the hundred thousand dollar shortage um, through that we did have a discussion regarding how much we could recoup from bags um, and mr. Casanova's can can confirm this but I think our revenues on bags are in the fifteen thousand dollar range even if we double that we're already a hundred thousand but down every year if we double it we can project that we'll get an extra fifteen thousand we're still going to have to look at the tonnage because that will just bring us down from the hundred seventeen thousand to a hundred and two thousand we still have to look at that deficit no i understand that i'm just saying would the the cost of the totals be less if we went up to that two dollar fee we might Mr. be able Mr. to shave Kazanovich is going to oh, address that yeah, uh, thank you madam chair um first of all we did consider that quite honestly we had a lengthy discussion about that um, and quite honestly the revenue that would be generated even at a dollar fifty from a dollar uh, would be no higher than five thousand dollars per year um, the fifteen thousand dollars collected for the previous year was a three-year high if you looked at the average it averaged about seven thousand so fifty if it went up by a dollar, you get an additional roughly on the average seven thousand dollars as an offset to the one seventeen. You're still talking in the vicinity of twelve percent, even at twelve and a half percent. We thought by increasing the bag fee, we could use that additional revenue as an offset to future year increases at the wheel, as well as um, 
um, allied waste. That's not even going to cover the, the cost of, of doing business the next year when they're increasing at a level of 2 to 3 percent. Um, so it, it's, I know it's, it's, it's meaningless in terms of total dollars, um, but we did consider that, and, and quite honestly, if it does go up by a dollar, it's, it's not going to do much by way of, of, of uh, that increase of 12.5 percent. The other benefit to using that or to increasing that is the extra monies could conceivably be used to buy the additional toters for recycling that people can request. Um, we are constantly looking towards the general fund for that money, and that's not really where it should come from. The solid waste program should pay for itself. So hopefully we'll be able to generate some revenues to buy the, if when people want a second recycle tota, we always encourage additional recycling. So if you're blowing out your recycle tota, we want to have the availability to give you an additional one to help increase the tonnage of recycling and thereby hopefully decrease the tonnage of solid waste. Mr. Grossman? Yes. Uh, the recycling uh, trash bins need to be closed. And I've had people approach me saying, I have something that extends beyond the cover, and can I put a blue bag around that and put it beside the container to add it to my recyclables? Um, understand that there's a blue bag on it. It's going in the trash. That's what the blue bags are for. It's not going to go into recyclables. So what does so. that person do? <sighs> Unfortunately, the system is not designed to to take in the 14-foot-long box. Um, if it can't be broken down, um, it, it, God, I hate to say this on TV, but it may have to go to the solid waste rather than the recyclables. If there's a bag tied around it, it's going to be thrown into the trash truck. That's what the that's what the dollar and hopefully dollar fifty allows the person to do is to add trash tonnage beside their trash. It's so, for example, and you just alluded to the fact, if you got what a mattress or a bed or whatever, and it's all wrapped in heavy-duty cardboard and so on, that it's too cumbersome to, to fold up and try to get into your recyclable uh, bin. You're saying that you'd have to bring it elsewhere. There's, there's an option to bring it directly to Casella. Um, I'm sure Casella would accept it as recyclable, but I, I understand that that would be a hassle above and beyond what's expected. Um, I've fought and lost wars with packaging sometimes. Um, breaking it up is, is miserable. Unfortunately, there, there may not be that alternative to recycle it if it doesn't fit in the bin. Mr. Simonian. Yeah. Have they have they changed the policy on that? And the, and the reason I ask is because there have been times, um, whether washing machine box or something like that, where I've torn it up into small pieces, just tied it in tw with twine and left it on the curb next to the recycling bin, and they've taken it. So, because that seemed to be the simple solution, just tearing it up into small enough pieces that I could. I will. And it, if they've changed that, like I said, I haven't done it in a while, but they used to seem to take it all the time, as long as it was you know ma in manageable size. I, I would. Just, that would probably benefit a lot of people if they could. Let me, um, I will call Mike Cezapan. He's the operations manager at Allied. Right. And I will try to work with him to come up with a way to get bulk recycling. Right. Um, I know that we've had a recent problem with bulk trash. Um, specifically, we had a long object that wouldn't fit in the toter. Um, I spoke to Mike today, and he, he agreed that he'll go back to it. If you tie a blue bag to it, we'll, we'll take it if it fits in the truck. Um, let me talk to Mike Cezapan. Let's see if I can work something out with him on how we can pick up bulk recycling. Right, I think it would be extremely beneficial to the town if we could. And to follow up on what Mrs. Simonian said, and I agree that whatever we can do to help with recycling this bulk material, but one of the concerns that we've had all along is the consistency of pickups mm -hmm. and whether it's the bin is open six inches or closed all the way or having recycling next to the recycling bin, we had asked for consistency because, you know, one resident says they didn't pick up my stuff because the bin was open. The next resident will, you know, says, oh, they picked up all my stuff. I had stuff piled next to it. And we had this discussion when we talked about the second recycling bin because there's, although I would agree, I think it's, we should be able to, 
cut up a box and tie it with twine and put it next to it, it wasn't allowed and that's why you needed that second toter. So, so again, I would ask that we have some type of consistency and be sure that that information is out there. If we're now going to allow large bulk pickup of recyclable materials, then it has to be consistent for everyone. The hauler is set up to use the claw truck and I'm sure he's gonna do everything he can so that his drivers don't have to get out, one, for inconvenience, and two, and more importantly, for safety. Um, they leave those trucks running and step out to the curb to get something. I realize they're professionals. They better put that truck in, you know, the emergency brake on and everything, but it's always I, a time you forget. So I assume that Mike Cezapan is gonna err on the side of caution and say the safety is more important than that one piece of recycling. And but. I will attempt to get some consistency anytime that there's complaints that they picked up his trash but not mine. I want to hear about it. Um, I know Ms. Jacobson sent me an email regarding an issue. I think she sent it to me yesterday. Um, I spent a good part of today researching, finding out options, and I got back to her. We can solve the problems. Um, the solution is going to be, you know, that guy who was lucky enough to have it open six inches, the solution is going to be no. If we're looking I, for consistency, the solution's going to err on the side of the policy, which says 100% close. So that guy whose head is open six inches is going to be calling you a lot more. And I, I would agree with you, and, that, and that's my concern, that, that we need to have consistency amongst the drivers. And, and yep. that, you know, the residents who, who are doing a lot of recycling, who have, who have been proactive and got, come up to town hall and gotten that second recycling, recycling toter, now you know, and being sure that everything is in that toter. Now we have residents who, who may be right. putting things next to it. We, we just really have to have consistency. Right. The policy is it's got to be in the toter, and the toter has to be closed. <coughs> um, if we're looking for consistency, I can, I feel pretty confident that Mike is going to lean towards the policy is what it is. Mm -hmm. It will be in the toters, and the toters will be closed. So I will ask him if there's a way we can do bulk recycling, now bulk item recycling. Um, but if we're looking for consistent pickup, it's going to come down to a decision of the driver. Could that have fit in the toter? If he, I, I think this may err on the side of policy, and it's going to be in the toter and closed. Okay. And uh, Mr. Um, Kasanovich is going to be heard. Um, I just want to remind the board that um, previously they had asked for information relative to cost. Uh, we had provided to the board Prior to tonight, on two separate occasions, uh, a similar analysis with charts and graphs over a period of time um, that actually showed uh, the level of commitment relative to uh, collection and um, disposal, as well as uh, a recycling analysis when we went to single stream and the dip that was generated as a result of that effort. Um, the board is... is asked to um, make a decision tonight because we want to put this into effect uh, July 1. Um, the assessor's office is now uh, preparing the billing cycle. Uh, and there's a lot of work in doing that. Um, the board could, could um, make a request to defer this, but once again, I want to remind them that that would fall on the backs of the taxpayers of this community who may not be um, utilizing this service. Um, we would have to make up that difference if there is a delay. Uh, it would probably require that we go above and beyond the 1.65 uh, in order to, in, of taxation in order to um, subsidize this. Uh, the revenue would have to come from general fund revenues uh, from somewhere. But like any activity, we try to show total costs and we try to maintain that through a fee structure as though this was being treated as an enterprise fund. And that's what, uh, we're not looking to make a profit, we're just looking to cover our costs. And that's what this analysis shows tonight. Is there anything else from board members? Is there any public comment or question? Um, we've Apology. talked a lot about extra recycling containers and everything. I want to make a statement now, take a half a step backwards. At the moment, the town doesn't have any extra ones. I am in the process of finding what monies we can to order some and my prediction is we will have some soon after July 1st. So we'll be, if people are looking for a second recycle container, we should have them soon after July 1st. And as with the last go-round, 
Do you have a wait list for those? We have a very short wait list. I believe okay. Mary in the assessor's office has probably four or five waiting on them. So they'll I'm call. i to get about 20 of them. They'll call the assessor's office? Yes, it's To be put on a list for the new, um, res, you know. Uh, a second recycle se A second bin. recycle yep. bin. Mr. Bonifilio, did you want to be heard? Yeah, please. Please. Hi, Jim Bonifilio, a member of the Solid Waste Committee. Um, just, just to clarify what the charge of our committee has been since I've been on it, which is over 10 years. The fees were always based on collection and disposal. That was it. That was the budget for the solid waste was just based on those two factors. That's what we based the fee on. This year is the only year we have considered the indirect costs. So. You know, going back a couple of years when we adjusted the fee schedule and we instituted recycling, we looked at it and the committee analyzed what we needed to do to meet the new contract. And that was really to have recycling at about 17%. That was the break even point at that time. Uh, we exceeded that and went to 22%, 22-23% recycling. So we were meeting the contract, the new contract plus the disposal, and there was actually a little bit of money left over. Uh, so this is the first year where we've had to look at this deficit. So I just wanted to make it clear, this is not something we've known for several years. It's always been based on the data we've had from the budget. So now all of a sudden we're looking at a $100,000 deficit. So the only way of doing this is to raise the fees. Uh, it's really plain and simple. Um, you know, we're hoping that recycling is going to get a little bit better. It has leveled off, but through education, that's what we're trying to do is increase that, uh, provide different areas of recycling other materials instead of throwing them in the trash, which they, some things should not be thrown in the trash, but everybody knows that they do. Thank you. Mr. Kazanovich. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we did provide this analysis that did show the indirect costs that previously went to the board. Uh, this did go to the Solid Waste Committee before. We did have this discussion about a year ago uh, when those yeah. numbers were first uh, compiled. Uh, a decision at that time, uh, well, there was no decision at that time as to a, um, a fee increase. Um, the matter set before the board. The board took no action. Uh, we did indicate at that time we would take it to solid waste. We did take it to solid waste. Uh, I think solid waste decision was to hold on a year um, to see how the, if there was any a further reduction in, in a single stream that would lead to a reduction at the wheel. Um, and so we followed up with an analysis again once the 14 budget was formulated. That's when we pulled this all together once again. Thank you. Mr. Smoney, did you have a last yeah, comment? Yeah. Um, you, mentioned, you mentioned that this is the first year that indirect costs came into play. What, what were some of those indirect costs that you had to consider? That well, the list that we, you have before right you of the indirect costs, um, this was really not something that we've dealt with as far as looking at the solid waste budget as far as the fee schedule. And like I said, this goes back uh, to the early 2000s, <laughs> the, you know, three contracts ago from uh, a handler's perspective. We always looked at what the cost of disposal was based on the previous year, and we always looked at what the collection contract was. And that's how we based the fee schedule was on that, on those two numbers. Going into solid, uh, going into recycling, we had to look at number one, a new contract, going into single stream, which was going to increase the contract. I think it increased the first year, I think it was like $35,000. I, I believe that that was, that was the cost for uh, single stream. Uh, which part of it was the new totes. Uh, but we based a 17% recycling rate would be a break even. It would pay for the increased cost in uh, collection contract and the disposal decrease.
tonnage wise by recycling. And that 17% was met. We actually exceeded it to about 22, 23%. Now we're looking at in addition, and I'm not saying the indirect cost is not something that should be included. It just never was in the past, but those costs were always been there. It's, we just never really used them to decide upon a fee. So I just wanted to clarify that as far as the committee goes. It's not like we knew and used these numbers 10 years ago. We never used indirect costs. Um, we never even took into consideration uh, the cost of picking up municipal buildings. It was just part of the contract. We didn't look at them. We were looking at strictly the disposal and collection and base the fee on those. So I just wanted to give a perspective of where the committee was looking at when they developed the fee schedule. Mr. Simonian. <clears throat> I, I'd, like, I'd like to ask the, uh, the other members of the board to consider um, requesting a quarterly or, at a minimum, a biannual report from the Solid Waste Committee. Given um, the changes that have been identified here, I think that um, and the trends over the next two years that we, we seem to think are going to happen, um, I'd, I'd like to at least twice a year have a report so that we can see what's coming rather than once a year. Um, and I'd like to get some feedback from the rest of the board um, to do at least, like I said, biannual and possibly quarterly, just to see these trends as they're going. I mean, and the point Mr. Holster made, two months, this is going to kick in, and it's, it's going to be an impact to a lot of people. Um, so I, I, think, I think that, you know, it's our responsibility to at least, you know, look at that and, and be more aware um, that it, that these things are potentially going to happen. I could just Mr. Bonfield, are you chairman? You, you are chairman of the committee? No. no? Uh, well, wh I'll just ask the question. How often do you meet and how often do you review the data? We meet monthly and we've been reviewing the data for months. Okay. So, so pretty much you, once you a month. Monthly. So, so it wouldn't be unreasonable to prepare a, a twice. If annual. we know exactly what you're looking for. Okay. Mr. Madam Chair, this, this report was actually based upon data supplied by the Solid Waste Committee okay. over the last year. Okay. Mr. Grossman. Yes. Uh, we're billed uh, twice a year mm -hmm. now, so if we were to get a report twice a year, that would be in sync with the billing cycle. If, we, if the board so chose. Okay. Oh, I have just one concern. In, in what you're proposing, uh, our contract runs until June of 2015. Uh, right. You feel that uh, the rate that we're that you're proposing is going to keep us on the uh, top side. <laughs> It's hard to say because uh, we can incur another increase at the wheel abrader next year. They could increase that fee up to $3 a ton. So we don't know. It's not in our control. Okay, so there's, there's no leeway in, in what you're proposing. It's only to cover where we stand right now. Should there be a change, we're in the hole again. I will defer to Ed. Um, well, certainly, I think Amy um, said that the wheel can go up by a value no greater than 3%. There is a 3% cap tied to the contract over the life of the contract. Um, so there is that potential, as well as the unknowns. Once the Allied Waste, formerly Central Mass contract, expires, that would have to go out for another term of up to five years, which would require, does that require? I think five years allowed under Mass General Law for solid waste contract. One of a few. Uh, without uh, I thought it was three, and a town can extend up to five and then extend okay, again. We'll have to take a look at that. But right now, we had a five year contract with Central Mass uh, and taken over by Allied. We don't know what those future costs are. We don't know what the competition is going to be like. We don't know who the major players in the area are going to be, and we don't know what the market is going to dictate at that time. 
Certainly when we put this together, we were hoping through at least a break even point with fur further education from the solid waste committee that we could mitigate those at least two year future costs. So this is something that we're committed to presenting on an annual basis based upon the most current data to show you where we are. So we prepared to uh, take action on this. Make a motion that we uh, get a, um, a biannual report from the Solid Waste Committee and uh, so we can uh, monitor uh, the fees. Is Second. there a second? Any discussion on that motion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So voted. Is there a motion regarding the request from the um, Solid Waste Committee on fees? As Mr. Kazanovich said, it's, it, this has been built in, and the request has been for this fiscal year. So is there an interest in supporting the Solid Waste Committee's recommendation of a 12 and a half fee adjustment. I make a motion that we accept the proposed new rates, $216, the large total and the, the small total, $176, which is the 12% increase. And the blue bag fee? Of $1.50. Is there a second? Second. Is there a discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed, so voted. Amy, just some, you know, certainly we'd like to see you look to um, increase the recycling. And if you have, you know, a recycling campaign, if there's anything that this board can do, if you want to come in and do a presentation, or if there's anything that this board can do, you know, so you have an audience, um, we, we really would like to be a part of that you know, promotional campaign to increase our recycling. Okay, and certainly use the website, use the um, town website, mm -hmm. the state DEP has a lot of information on their website. Email me, a lot of people have emailed me with um, specific questions, and yeah. uh, it really is up to all of us to reduce and reuse and recycle as much yeah. as possible to keep that fee down. Yeah, and it was, when it was new, people were excited about it, and, and I think that we've gotten complacent, and that's why I think if we kind of do a, you know, a recycling, more recycling campaign, um, okay. we may remind people that it's a good thing to do. Okay. Thank you for Thank your presentation. You. Thank you, everyone, for Thank you very being much. here tonight. The next agenda item is a letter from the Massachusetts State Lottery Commission, Kino to go Honey Farms, number 17, 714 Southbridge Street. In your packet, you have a letter. Um, the only action that the board would need to take is if we object to um, the offering of a Kino monitor at this location. Um, we would have to send a letter within 21 days. Do any board members have any objection to this? Mr. Holstrom? I have uh, one comment. Um, from May 7, 2013, this is the document we received in our packets. Um, we have the name of the applicant and the address is 20 Lynn Street, but I don't know where Lynn Street is. And I think we want to complete that document and be sure that we have all the uh, pertinent information. This is different. It's a different. But what I'm saying is the name of the applicant and the address on the top is 20 Lynn Street, but it does not give us a town. Different agenda item. I'm on the keynote to go. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This is the year. Thank you. I was putting the two of them together. Okay. Here. That's Thank okay. You. So um, do any members, board members have any objection? Hearing none, we, we, we will take no action on that. Under Board of Selectmen items, we have a common victualers license for Tutti Frutti Frozen Yogurt. In your packet, you have the application and comments from the DCG. Is the applicant here? If you could come up to the microphone, please. Give your name for the record and tell us a little bit about um, your proposal before the board. Yes, my name is Durrani. I'm here on behalf of Tutti Fruity Self Serve Frozen Yogurt, which is a family owned business right now. Uh, it came out from California. Um, we're looking forward to expand into Massachusetts. I'm one of the manager at the Fezzer Lane Mall, which is located in Nashua, New Hampshire. We currently have four locations in New Hampshire, um, and they're only in the Simon Mall. This is the first Tutti Fruity Frozen Yogurt that we are trying to open in Massachusetts. I am here today to try to get licensing for our business in the Auburn Mall. 
and I'm really looking forward to do business with you guys here. And I do have a few copies of our plan. I don't you know if you guys want give any. them to Sharon and she'll pass them down to us. And uh, the lease that we're about to sign with the Auburn Mall is going to be a 10-year lease. And, and did you meet with the um, DCG? Was it you who met with the DCG? Yes, there was three of us, but only okay. two of us could come today. Okay, so, so, so you met with them and you understand um, the recommendations that they made. The applicant um, shall obtain all necessary permits from the Board of Health um, for all final inspections to be yes. completed. And the applicant shall obtain all necessary building com permits, including but not limited to a certificate of occupancy yes. inspection. So you understand that you, if, if the board votes tonight to give you this license, you would still need to c complete the process. Correct, yes. Okay, and Mr. Holstrom had um, a question on your application as to the address. Yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, the address here is at 20 Lynn Street, but it does not give us a town. Or a it's in Lawrence, area. Massachusetts. Okay, so we want to be sure that I guess our documentation for our office uh, is um, updated so we know what that is. And it's in Lawrence, Massachusetts. Correct. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Holstrom, for catching that. To any members, so this is just the layout in the mall where um, they will be, the floor plan at the Auburn Mall. Just to let you guys know, um, the location that we are going to take, it was previously Regis Salon, and it's right across from Best Buy Mobile. Mrs. Brotherton. I'm sorry, ma'am. Where, where did you say it was going to be across from? If I'm not wrong, it's directly across. Well, there's a kiosk in front of the Regis Salon and then Best Buy Mobile. Best Buy Mobile. Okay. Yes. It was the, the Regis Hair Salon, which is. Yes. Yes. About halfway. I thought you meant mall. Best Buy. I was going okay. like, when did that I'm go I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions or comments? Is there any public question or comment? Is, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. Is there a motion? i make a motion to approve the license provided all applicable requirements of the state and town, any of its departments, boards, and commissions have been fulfilled. Said license is subject to all the conditions stated upon it. Failure to comply with any and all conditions shall invalidate the license and render it null and void with, and with the conditions of the D D DCG. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed to voting? Good luck with your Good new luck. business. Good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, silly question. So where do I get the license paper and all that? Or do I just continue on with what I'm doing? You, the next building. You're going to go oh. to the to the next small building, the um, manager board of selectmen building. Okay. It's. Is it's it the, open now? Or do I have to go back no, tomorrow? No, tomorrow. Okay. Thank you okay. very much. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Eight to four. The next item we have is gift acceptance, and we have to the town of Auburn from the friends of the Pappas Recreation Complex. Um, and I'd like to read the letter. Dear Auburn Board of Selectmen, on behalf of the Friends of Pappas Recreation Complex Corp, I would like to donate a check in the amount of $5,230 to the Town of Auburn for the purpose of funding engineering work performed by Lenard Engineering relating to the permitting process for a proposed playground at the Pappas Recreation Complex. The $5,230 check is the result of fundraising efforts by the Friends of Pappas. The $5,230 is being given with the understanding and condition that these funds be used to pay Lenard Engineering for the services associated with the permitting for a playground at Pappas Recreation Complex and is based upon a quote to the town by Lenard Engineering dated April 25, 2013. The Friends of the Pappas Recreation Complex 
Lux is a 501c3 corporation, and its sole purpose is to help raise funds to help the town further develop the Pappas Recreation Complex. Mrs. Jacobson. If I may, through the chair, I just want to make a, a point of thanking the Friends of the Pappas Recreation Complex for all the work that they've done. They were invited to come tonight. Unfortunately, they couldn't come. We tried to find a date where they, someone could be here, but we wanted to make sure that we were able to get the check deposited. So I promised them that I would just make a note that, number one, they wanted to be here. They had another event that was going on tonight and couldn't make it. But they've just done a great job with fundraising on behalf of the Pappas Complex. And this is going to be the piece that will enable us to start with the um, engineering and design work that needs to be done. So we're looking forward to working with them. Uh, Bill Coyle, the DPW director, has done a great job working with the Friends of the Pappas Complex as well as uh, helping them through the process relating to what's the best route for doing this. And this was the best route for ha to have them donate the money uh, to the town and then have the town enter into a contract with Leonard because the property that is town owned property even though the playground will be uh, privately financed through a fundraising efforts and uh, just a reminder there is a challenge grant that's been out there from the uh, Pappas family from Dr. Martha and Dr. Arthur Pappas and I believe that expires March of 2014 and they will match up to I believe a hundred thousand dollars in funds uh, that are raised through the community. So just a reminder that that is out there for raising money for the playground. And any questions, I believe the Friends of the Pappas Recreation have a website and everything's on there. And you can always contact Town Manager's Office so we can provide information or DPW uh, Bill Coyle. Is there a motion? I'd like to make a motion to accept the check for $5,230 to the Town of Auburn from the Friends of Pappas Recreation. Is With there, gratitude. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Any Aye. opposed? So voted. Aye. Next we have um, for the fire department gift account from Donald, um, Donald E. Anderson in the amount of $100. Is there a motion? Motion to accept. With gratitude. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So voted. We also have um, two Two gifts to be used for the Purple Heart Fund. The first is from Gail Holloway in the amount of $25, and another gift in the amount of $100 from Martha Enman in memory of Albert Enman. Is there a motion? Motion to accept. We have two. Yes, sir. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So voted. And I see um, before we move on with the agenda, we have some people sitting in the audience with agenda items. If I would entertain a motion to move up a couple of the town manager items. The first being A, I'm sorry, 8B, notification of bequests to the fire department in the library. Motion to move up agenda item 8B. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So voted. Mrs. Jacobson, I see we have some people from the library and the fire department here regarding this item. Through the chair, and I will uh, turn this to Ed Kazanovich, also as the CFO. He's done a lot of work on this, but we're uh, very happy to uh, notify the board that we received two uh, um, sums of money that were bequeathed to the town from the estate or the trust of Norm McCard. And it was uh, specifically funds for the fire department and for the library. And Mr. Kazanovich and myself have met with the library director who is here t this evening, uh, Diane Ramsey, as well as the chairman of the board of the library trustees and the vice chair is here tonight, um, Bobby Baker, as well as the fire chief to discuss how we could best utilize these funds. So I'd like to turn it over to Ed Kazanovich. Uh, thank you, Julie. Um, I'd just like to inform the board that we received two equal amounts, 120,800 and change, uh, which we received uh, last week. Uh, Upon receiving uh, the check, we immediately had discussions on uh, what to do with that. Uh, it is unrestricted, um, as far as we know. Uh, the check came in, and it's to be expended at the discretion of the uh, library director, as well as the board of trustees and the fire chief. That being said, uh, we uh, recommended that we set both of those up in a non-expendable trust. Uh, that would earn interest every year. That interest could be expended based upon the priorities identified by both the fire chief and the board of trustees 
in conjunction with the library director. Uh, everyone thought that was a, uh, um, a prudent thing to do. Um, based upon that, we have established separate trust and notified our, um, our consultant on the investment of those funds, uh, which um, we met this morning with. It will go into a larger portfolio, uh, and it will be distributed um, and invested with approximately $7 million of other funds that we have through trust and, and um, in stabilization account. Uh, that being said, I'll, I'll, I'll turn, uh, turn it over to both fire and police, uh, and they can explain uh, the, uh, discussions they had relative to utilization of these funds. Library. Library. Sorry about that. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Bobby Baker from the um, Board of Trustees for the Auburn Library. Um, just a quick little statement. Um, the library trustees are pleased to recognize the generosity of longtime friend and patron Norma Card. We are truly blessed to live in a community with such dedicated and devoted citizens. At the next meeting of the Board of Trustees, which will be not this Wednesday, but the following Wednesday, we will finalize um, basically what the, the board will have to vote on exactly what we were doing with the money. But the suggestion is that we are bringing forward to the board is that the money be placed in an account um, and that the interest be used for programming or whatever other needs that the library director um, feels is necessary um, per year. Um, one of the reasons for doing that, and basically the best reason we feel for doing that is if we follow this course, um, that, then we ensure that the gift basically goes on in perpetuity. It's not just a one-time thing that we use for one thing. It's something that we can keep using, um, which basically um, is better for the citizens. So, Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Chief. Good evening. Thank you. Um, I, I, too, would, would like to extend uh, my gratitude uh, to Norma Card. Uh, Norma was a wonderful woman. Uh, who was very supportive of the fire department and uh, very supportive of me personally uh, as the chief, and I, I always appreciated that. And uh, I, let's just say that on the Monday morning when I opened the envelope, I was shocked but not surprised. I guess I'll put it that way. Uh, because her generosity, this, this is right up her alley. Uh, so again, shocked but not surprised. So uh, very humbled that... Uh, she bestowed this gift on us. Uh, much like the library, um, I've given it a lot of thought in terms of what we were going to do uh, with the money. And <clears throat> again, I didn't want to just spend it on something that was going to be forgotten about in a week, you know, although it may be important, you know, sort of no, nobody's going to remember it a week later. Uh, so I've been, I've been thinking about uh, some sort of a legacy project uh, that we could, we could do on Norma's behalf. And what I've come up with is replacement of the fire department's training facility. Uh, that facility was constructed on West Street 15 years ago. Uh, it has been a tremendous asset to the, to the fire department. Uh, we are one of the few communities around that have the benefit of having our own training facility. Uh, that facility has grown over the years uh, at the hands of the firefighters themselves, volunteering their time and effort to come out and grow and expand the facility to what it is today. Uh, I think it was always the hope that the facility was going to be slated to be replaced when it hit the 20-year mark. It's sort of showing its age now, but we're piecing it together. We're making it work. But there is currently no funds available in the capital or any other, uh, you know, no other means to replace that facility. And I thought this would be uh, a perfect opportunity to do that. Again, Norma was always very supportive of the, of the fire department, and, and every time that I ran into Norma, she'd always make it a point to tell me, uh, how professional and polite and well-trained our personnel was. So I can't think of a better project uh, than continuing the professionalism and the training <coughs> of our members in a training facility that ultimately will be uh, named in her honor. That's wonderful. So, thank you very much. Thank you. thank you. And I'll just say, if anyone knew Norma Codd, she loved life, she loved people, and she loved the town of Auburn. And her generosity is very much appreciated. Is that it on that? Okay. And through the chair um, to the to the board as well. 
I had notified the board maybe um, within a day or so of us receiving the checks, and actually the checks did go directly to the department, so it was about a day lag by the time we got the information. It took us a couple days to get um, from the trust information. There had been a question as to whether there was an additional amount of money that had been left to the town for another department, and Mr. Kazanovich checked that out through the attorney for the trust, and that is not true. So the amounts that um, we are discussing tonight, the $220,000, are the two departments that were bequeathed funds. Uh, there was no third amount of money, as may have been uh, rumored or spoken about it. So I just want to make sure that that was clear that I did we do not have any additional money beyond that, but we are so grateful for these two donations. It's, it's uh, wonderful. It's going to give us an opportunity to, through the trust, to generate the interest that will support the capital improvements that we're looking to do. Thank you. Um, yes. Uh, I feel that, that what the library is doing is keeping Nama Card's name out there in perpetuity. The fire department, yes, you need a training center, but you're spending all the money or the majority of the money all at once. And if it's done in that manner, I feel that the building should at least be named after her. I think you said that. I think you said that, yeah. I think, I think. Through the chair, uh, just to clarify, I, I, I thought I made that clear in my in my statement. Um, the the facility uh, we're going to look obviously we'd like to grow the interest, so we're we're not going to touch it for five years, and and so the plan would be to uh, construct the facility, and the facility will be named in her honor. Yes. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll entertain a motion to move up agenda item eight A. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So voted. This is a report on the electronics take back event. Good evening again. I'm going to step back and let my electronics genius get this thing running. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good then. <laughs> Good evening. Um, it's unfortunate that Miss Sullivan stepped out. She was instrumental in bringing this to Auburn. Um, very pertinent topic, considering the topic we last discussed extensively. Um, as always, we are constantly looking for ways to improve our recycling and to divert solid waste from the waste stream to other beneficial uses. Um, first week of April, Miss Amy Sullivan came to me, and actually I think she came to Darlene first, um, I was out of the office, and presented us with a flyer from a company called MetTech Recycling. They're a company in Worcester that is already on our webpage. I have a section of our webpage that lists all kinds of alternative ways to dispose of things. Um, we've had an association with MetTech, but this particular flyer was for an event taking place in Worcester. MetTech was doing a electronics take back program for free for any citizen of Worcester or anybody who wanted to drop off there. Um, Darlene and I took that flyer and we said, why can't we do something like this in Auburn? Um, my concern was the short time span that we had to pull it together. So my first recommendation was, let's see if MetTech will entertain a drop off program for the town of Auburn, but specifically to clean out the town buildings, the library, the schools, the town hall, all the electronics we've accumulated. We just got a new phone system so we could get rid of all the old phones. Um, so we called uh, MetTech, and MetTech says, yeah, we can do that. Um, you know this event closes on the 19th. Your window of opportunity closes on April 19th. So here we are, middle of the first week of April. We had essentially a week and a half to pull together a quick program. So. Um, in a discussion with Butch Larson at Casella, 
he said, oh, you're going to have take, uh, electronics take back? We'll offer you a roll-off. So now we have another public partner involved with uh, partnering up with us to accomplish things. Um, throughout the first weekend, we had all of the town buildings emptied, and we had the roll-off about a third full. So Darlene and I again sat down and said, well, I don't want to send this thing back a third full. What can we do to fill it? And I said, why don't we open it to the public? So Darlene, and, and to be fair, she first suggested it at the beginning, and I said we should probably limit it to town buildings and see what we get for volume first. Um, having made the decision to bring it to the public, we, where am I going? Here? Wrong, there? God, I'm good at this. Um, we threw together a flyer, and we quickly put that flyer on. Actually, we approached the Board of Health on Monday evening at the board meeting. We needed, because it's a Board of Health program, we needed Board of Health approval. So Board of Health said, yeah, sounds like a good program. Um, don't know how much, how much response you'll get in the short period that you have to advertise, but let's see what we can get. So we threw together a flyer. By the middle of the day, Tuesday, we had the flyer on the web page and on the, uh, and on the um, cable TV. From there, we kind of gauging phone calls and stuff. We didn't think we were getting that great a response. So I asked Ms. Jacobson if we could go throw together a non-emergency response or an emergency situation code red. Um, as you may know, anything emergency related or public health related, we can do for free on code red. We only have a certain amount of dollars to do social events, beneficial events. Um, but she gave her approval feeling that this was a beneficial program to the town of Auburn. So I sent out a code red message. I believe it was Wednesday or Thursday of that week. Um, and I'm going to say it was unfortunate timing. I know we don't want to use the word unfortunate in this because this was a great event and it went off real well. But it blew out of the water. This event, we, we, just, we just blew the property out of the water. Um, I will stand here and say... The week that we had this, I went on vacation, which seems to be the norm. I had a hazardous waste day last year, and I was on vacation for it. So I asked Miss Darlene was working for Luster at the time. I asked her and Ray to run it for me, and it was an unbelievable success. And I was on vacation for this one, and I asked Darlene to, to be our operations officer for this one. And it was, an, it was just a, a rolling success. So I think the norm in the future will be for me to set everything up and then go away. It seems to work. <laughs> um, so what I would like to do is at this time, um, Darlene will talk about the actual operation, what went on at the event, um, how she handled issues that came up. So I'll turn it over to, and I'm going to call Darlene my assistant because in the year she's been with me, she has become so much more than an inspector. She is my right hand. So I'm going to turn this over to my assistant right now to present how the day went that day. Actually, the two days. Thank you, Andy. Good evening. Good evening. Um, so the, uh, the event that we had, um, obviously, in the uh, small time that we were able to put it together, we had um, all different types of electronics. This is a sample of uh, what we collected um, for that week. Uh, we had numerous televisions. Television was, was probably our biggest item. We had all pieces of computers, monitors, the CPUs. Uh, we had VCRs, um, the old VHS tapes, uh, radios. We actually saw some really old, old radios. Um, as you can see, this was kind of our operation. We had a uh, entrance at the DPW yard off of Millbury Street. Um, where you'd come in to drop off your leaf pile brush. We actually set up an, an area where they could come through. Um, this shows the, uh, the vehicles coming up. As you can see in the, in the background, we have uh, pallets set up. So the, uh, the line of cars would come through. They'd pull up. We had uh, DPW staff, um, and they were, they were unbelievable. Car would pull up. We would get the uh, electronics and so forth out. We'd stack them on the pallets. And we did that all day um, Saturday and Sunday. They would actually exit around the DPW uh, garage. So we had a pretty good flow. This will show you um, here the pallets. As we're setting up pallets here, um, we, would, we had some large collection TVs. Um, we saw TVs that uh, 
were from probably the uh, 1980s. Uh, so they were the uh, big mammoth TV, TV, TV excuse me. Um, this shows you uh, one of the large TVs. In the background, um, we have a uh, blue container from Casella. Casella Waste was instrumental in, um, in their generous donation. They allowed us that container at no cost. And um, we were so busy, we filled that container uh, pretty quickly. And um, they gave us a second container to uh, fill. Um, we had both of those containers completely full and additional, uh, probably about additional 80 pallets that we moved to uh, Metech Recycling. Um, again, we couldn't have done this without all of the uh, community partners here. Um, again, they would, it was almost like a puzzle piece. We put as many electronics on that pallet as we could. Um, we blew through approximately about 50 pallets um, in a couple of hours. Uh, Home Depot was so generous with us on Saturday. Um, they allowed us to um, take pallets at no cost, and uh, we used those pallets to build our, uh, our electronics throughout Saturday and Sunday. Again, this shows you, um, this is the look of uh, outside of the DPW garage. We're taking the picture going out. So again, the leaf pile is in the background the cars would pull up and exit around the building. Again, DPW staff uh, were wonderful. The leaf pile um, staff and DPW workers were tireless in everything. This actually kind of gives you perspective. This was at the end of our first day. Um, so here uh, we have one whole corner, uh, about a, uh, one quarter of the garage. Normally we would have the trucks, you can kind of see here, Trucks would be piled, uh, parked um, throughout the garage. We had to move the trucks out in order to um, handle the flow of all the electronics. Um, understand that the, uh, this was after we blew out two roll-offs, two 30-foot roll-offs. And when we stacked the roll-offs, we stacked them floor to ceiling and tight. So this was day one, two roll-offs plus this, plus whatever is still outside there. This actually gives you a perspective of uh, what the inside of the DPW garage, and this is after day two. Um, so we were completely full on to the left side of the screen, all the way across, and all the little side units in between the trucks, we actually had electronics piled. Um, it, was, it was a pretty, um, pretty busy event. Um, this is... Uh, some collection totals that we had um, reported to us from Metech Recycling. Again, it took them, uh, actually we just got these totals not too long ago. It actually took them um, some time to figure out and, um, and categorize the different electronics. As you can see, as I mentioned earlier, televisions are the um, number one um, item that was uh, in abundance. Um, Second, the computer monitors um, and components. We had printers, faxers, scanners. Um, we were able to clear out a lot of the stuff that's in these town buildings as well. And um, this was a breakdown of the collection totals. This is um, what our, uh, if you were to take all the totals on the previous slide and add them together, we recycled four, 46 1,565 pounds of electronic waste. Um, it comes out to be, I believe, about 23 tons. Comes out to be just over 23 tons. We are talking 14 Hyundai Elantras, the equivalent weight. Um, ridiculous amounts of e-volume that came out of a very short notification event. The 46,000 pounds um, was literally each one of those items was picked up out of the car and stacked on pallets. From the pallets, it was moved into the garage. From the garage, it was brought into the um, containers provided by Casella, um, pallets provided by uh, Home Depot. And from that point, um, the following week, we coordinated with the DPW and Casella to move all of that waste over to MetTech Recycling, where they accepted it. Um, at no cost to the town. 
this kind of gives you a perspective. You can see how many items are on each pallet. We had to literally stack them like a puzzle piece. And then what we did is um, uh, we did saran wrap. Um, we tightened the, uh, the load so they wouldn't fall over and hurt anybody. We also used duct tape, um, anything to keep it stabilized. <coughs> Benefits of this event. Um, the electronic waste was taken out of the waste stream. Earlier in your um, meeting, um, there, were, there was a lot of discussion about what we can do to um, help us with those municipal solid waste numbers and trying to um, cut the cost to the resident. This is one of those events that we saw as an opportunity and we, um, we wanted to bring that to um, the residents. Um, so that, that's something that we, we are going to continue to look for events like this for um, opportunities in order to take that um, municipal solid waste and, and reduce the, the numbers and costs. The Department of Environmental Protection is continuously passing laws that says you can't put this waste in the waste stream anymore, you can't put that waste in the waste stream anymore. And in those laws, they failed to take the opportunity to say, we're going to put this in place where you can put it. One of the missions of the Board of Health has been and continues to be when these waistbands are put into place, we try to find an alternative for the people. We don't want to say no without saying yes to something. So an event like this allows us, um, electronics are banned from the waste stream, construction debris is banned from the waste stream, um, medical sh shops are banned from the waste stream. Um, between our public partners such as Casella and the Board of Health programs, we're trying to find alternative programs so that people can get rid of stuff like this. The, um, uh, the 23 tons that METEC took, um, I uh, asked them if we were to have to pay for that as a town, what that would have cost us. It would have cost us over $10,000. Uh, $10,244.30 is what it would have cost us had we had to pay for that. Um, so we were very, um, very appreciative. It was a really, really great event. We were surprised by um, the response, and it was a nice surprise. Um, we had to hustle, and we, and we did do a lot of work. Um, again, all these community partners, it, it was unbelievable, their generosity. DPW did a great job, um, and I, I, have to, I have to add, because this was one of the points um, that was very important to METEC Recycling, is to make sure all of the electronics, when we received them, that we kept them secure. Um, because a lot of people dropping off their old computers, their monitors, there's a lot of um, information, personal information on there. Um, we had to commit to make sure that all that um, electronic material was kept secure and that's why uh, it was kept in uh, the locked containers provided by Casella and also um, at uh, the DPW garage. This uh, cost savings of $10,000 takes into account only the cost of disposal if we went if we had taken the stuff to MetTech and had to pay for it. Um, this is a cost directly saved by the citizens of the town because they would have been the ones who would have had to bear the cost. Um, in addition to that we got to remember there were two roll-offs, 30-foot roll-offs from Casella, and every time that I've rented a, a dumpster of any significant size, it's five to $600 for a dumpster, um, plus hauling costs, so another 2,000 there. Plus, we did not have to buy any pallets for this. The uh, Home Depot stepped up, and they, they were just continuously offering us pallets. Um, in addition to that, throughout the week, this, we didn't get this moved in the weekend. Throughout the week, the members of the DPW um, stepped up and they were hauling all week long. I believe it wasn't until Wednesday, Thursday, or maybe even Friday that we got the last of the TVs out of their garage and allowed them to park their trucks where they actually belong again. But throughout the week, um, Bill Coyle and his crew, um, and you know something I'm gonna give, I'll give Bill second credit, his crew stepped up and, and they were just there for us. Um, so the total cost to the town of Auburn ended up being just over $700. That money came out of an account that we have separated to handle hazardous waste, so it did not affect the general fund or the operating budgets. Um, it's, it's an account that is dedicated to hazardous waste and special waste. So I, I just can't thank the people enough for keeping this cost down and, and just for making it happen. 
Again, I want to um, just bring your attention, um, members of the board, um, our community partners, Casella, MedTech, and Home Depot, were so generous with the town. And um, I just want you to know how wonderful they were to work for, uh, work with, and um, we really do appreciate and, um, and, and value their, their uh, business. We have current partnerships with Casella in our shops collection program. We have current partnerships with MetTech. They're on the web page as a place to get rid of recycling. Um, Home Depot is now going to be one of my favorite partners in town. Um, we are currently reaching out to Wheeler Brader for a partnership and a program that we're trying to launch. Um, the commercial base in this town has never failed to step up to the plate for us. CVS has been great for us, um, but particularly today, these three partners went above and beyond anything we could have requested. It was short order on every request. It wasn't like we said, let's plan this thing for the future. We called them up and said, we're in trouble. And, and they stepped up and helped us out. So Casella, Home Depot, and MetTech today are, are the heroes for the town of Auburn Board of Health. And again, the DPW did a great job. They, they really uh, they hustled. Um, this is uh, just a sample of um, our, the crew that happened to be there on Saturday um, with all of the electronics behind them. This kind of gives you another perspective, just how much electronics was, was collected. And then I, I thought this was important to show you. This is actually METEC um, provided to the town a certificate of destruction. As I mentioned earlier, it was very important that, um, that, they, that we kept that uh, electronic equipment secure so that it could be, um, it could be destroyed. And we do have a uh, certificate of destruction from METEC. Um, so I thought it was important that you saw that and, uh, and that the residents saw that their electronics that they dropped off were safe and they have been destroyed and they don't have to worry about anything they dropped off. Excellent. And uh, again, I just wanted to um, thank you and thank the residents for helping us make this a huge success. Thank you. Does anyone have anything? A big thank you. Yeah. Huge thank you to all those who participated. They did a great job. They did an excellent job. If I can have a motion to move up item 8C. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. So voted. We have a request to declare surplus property from the fire chief and closed as a letter from the fire chief. We have several items. Do any members have any questions? The chief is here if any members have any questions. Is there a motion? I make a motion to approve the request to declare the property as surplus. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So voted. And the last item to move up that we have someone waiting for is the heavy commercial vehicle excu exclusion um, item 8D. Motion move up. Is there a second on moving it up? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Item 8D is moved up. Mr. Coyle. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Julie, Ed, Sharon. Um, first, I wanted to echo Andy and Darlene's appreciation to the DPW employees on their hard work um, that particular week. There was 46,000 tons of material that were moved by hand, and uh, my the DPW employees did a, a, lot, a lot of that work, and um, I think it was Friday around 2 o'clock that it was finally completed and the, the um, garage was finally empty. So they, they did a lot of hard work, and uh, I think the thanks doesn't go to, go to me. I didn't do the work. They did the work, and they, um, I really do appreciate their efforts in that. Um, but tonight, um, I was asked to come before you due to um, a recent request relative to a, a truck exclusion. And this is something that comes up from time to time. And quite honestly, when I get the call regarding this issue, along with speed limits and speed bumps, I, I somewhat cringe because I know typically the people aren't going to like the response that I give to them because all of these issues are very sensitive issues and very um, complex issues. Um, 
Excuse me, excuse me one minute, Mr. Claude, just so members know, this is in regards to the email that we all received um, on Packajog requesting that there, um, we look into a truck exclusion. So all members had received that email, as well as the DPW director and the manager. Right, thank you. I, I wasn't going to get into that specifics on that, but you are correct. We did receive a, a request, mm -hmm. and rather than discussing it each, with each member, I think town manager thought it was important to present the, the information to the board and also for the general public to hear as well. Um, it's important to know that whenever somebody contacts me directly for a, a truck exclusion, um, the thing that's difficult is that we, the town of Auburn, does not approve truck exclusions. We can support a truck exclusion, but ultimately Mass DOT has to approve a truck exclusion. And there are several significant criteria that they look at. Um, one of them, and probably the most significant, is that the average daily traffic on that roadway, at least 5% of the traffic has to be trucks. And for a lot of the roads in town, they probably won't meet that threshold. For example, where we had mentioned Packachog, Packachog carries over 7,000, Packachog Street, over 7,000 cars per day. So that would mean at least 350 of those vehicles would have to be commercial trucks capable of carrying over two and a half tons. So that's one criteria that I think a, a large percentage of the, again, of the roadways in town would not meet. We have to identify an alternate route. And we can't, so what we do is we can say this, route, this road would be a truck exclusion. This is our alternate route. That alternate route and the excluded route cannot involve an adjacent community. If it does, we then have to get the support of that adjacent community. So if one of the main roads, for example, Packachog Street, ties into College uh, Street, College Hill by Holy Cross, we would also need the support of City of Worcester for that truck exclusion. And then we would have to identify an alternate route and also agree on that, on that alternate route as well. Um, a few other points, I just want to look at my notes quickly. Um, adjacent community, uh, an engineering study, we would also have to look at the surrounding area. Uh, we do look at the proximity of schools, other features, um, the, the width of the roadway, the ability of the roadway to carry, uh, the, the weight of the trucks. And some of the other issues are we don't want to push the problem to another street. So if we, if we sign one roadway to truck exclusion, where are, those other, where are the trucks going to go beyond that point? So even if we did meet that threshold of the 5% of the volume of trucks on the roadway, looking at the alternate route, are we just moving the problem from one neighborhood to another neighborhood? Um, and we'd want to look at accident history. Have there been accidents involving trucks um, in particular? Um, so those are some of the key things that we'd have to look at. And then ultimately, if the town supported a truck exclusion and if there was a neighboring city or town, uh, we would both then petition mass DOT. We would have an engineering study showing all a, a huge amount of data, which I, I probably won't go over tonight, um, to them. They would then review it and then determine whether or not they wanted to allow truck exclusion. So it, unfortunately, it's not a simple process of just providing signs that say no trucks. It's, it's much more in depth than that and it's very complex. Um, so unfortunately, when people call me, my initial response is that it's not likely, not likely that you're going to get one. It's in fact very unlikely that you will. Um, so I'd be happy to give more information if anyone wants to talk to me tomorrow on this or anyone in the public wants to discuss it. Um, there's a whole manual on the procedure and what's required. And again, I'd be happy to review that with anybody or try to answer any questions tonight that you may have. Mr. Simonian. Yeah. Um, I don't, did you, did you um, speak with the person who sent the email? She called uh, approximately a month ago. And through the, uh, my administrator in the office, I corresponded with her. I provided the information relative to the truck exclusion. Um, I also spoke with Mr. Uh, with Mr. Holstrom as well on this. She did contact uh, him as well. I did go to her residence about a week and a half ago during the day. Unfortunately, she wasn't home. I wanted to try to talk to her in, in person as well. Um, and again, I, I know the town manager was going to respond to her, I believe, tomorrow. And again, if she has any additional information or, or questions that she'd like from me, I'd be happy to talk with her as well. All right. Um, I, know, I know that she spoke to Mr. Holstrom. I had, I had talked to her uh, as well. And I, I don't think she was trying to exclude trucks from Packachog Street. I think she was talk more worried about Davis Street. Mm -hmm. and, and, and one of the th a couple of things that she conveyed to us was that a truck tried to make the turn and couldn't, got stuck there. Um, also, uh, there was another truck, or possibly the same one, 
an 18 willow that almost took out a fire hydrant. Um, she said she had a picture of the tire tracks being within inches of the fire hydrant. And then um, one of the other th questions I had, which, which seems like it would be a concern, she said that it seems some of the trucks are, are going up Upland Street, turning onto Davis, then turning from Davis onto Packachog. So I, my concern on that is, and, and again, I understand the criteria you just outlined, but if an 18 wheeler were to go all the way to the end of Upland Street, where it comes out to Curtis, I don't see how they could possibly make that turn without going on either someone's property or that island. Um, so I, I don't know, I mean, is that enough of a concern to generate? Any? Well, it goes back to we don't set the criteria or okay. ultimately approve it. So even on Davis Street, if that, if that roadway were to get um, uh, 500 cars per day, she would need at least 25 of those to be trucks. And I, I know not to get into some of the specifics, but I saw numbers of three indicated in here. So I don't, I don't think the numbers sound like they're going to meet that threshold. Um, and my concern with Davis Street in particular, and I wasn't going to get too much into this, but the problem is if you sign Davis as no trucks, then you're going to push the problem to Leslie Manor, Lexington, you're just going to move the problem to another side street. So then if you post all those no trucks, then you're going to the intersection that you're referring to, to Upland and Curtis. And unfortunately, you can't post everything no trucks. And I think that's why the state has that threshold. So the, the solution would be, and I don't think people want to hear the solution, the solution to that problem would be to widen an intersection to accommodate the trucks because you're not going to get truck exclusion. So then what is the solution? Then the solution is if this is the route that they're taking, then you, you, turn, you widen the turning radius to accommodate the truck. And I, I don't think people want, want to see that, and it's not something that I would do unless it was something requested by um, the board or the town manager. So unfortunately, unless we meet the criteria for a truck exclusion, we can't even consider it. So then you have to look at what other options do we have. I did look at, I, I did contact the police department relative to accident history. They did review Davis, uh, Davis Street in, in the past three years. Um, there have been two accidents in three years, none of them involving trucks. And one was a vehicle backing up from Davis um, to Packachog. So the initial review of accident history doesn't support that trucks are a problem with accidents. There haven't been any in three years. And I'd hate to see post one road, which I don't think we'd be able to do that and then move the problem to another road. No, I'm not. And unfortunately, I agree with you, uh, Mr. Simone, that, that is a shortcut. People go up Jerome to Packachog to Davis over either to uh, Upland Street or Upland Gardens to go over to Greenwood Street. And I think a lot of the locals know that route. And I think people with GPS units, unfortunately, in this day and age, they show that route as well. I'm, I'm not advocating for posting it as, as a truck exclusion. I'm, I'm merely pointing out, I, I think there are a lot of concerns over there because I don't know what the process is, but I'm sure it would be some cost to the town if one of those 18 wheelers were to wipe out a fire hydrant. Well, it would be a cost to the uh, Elm Hill Water District. Okay. Uh, but <laughs> Still, it's. Why? It's they did, the I, did, I also. I, well, trucks have to go somewhere. You can't exclude trucks throughout that. the town. I, I did contact the Elm Hill Water District. Um, th that is a new hydrant. They did say they set it back as far as they could. It's been there about, a, I think, about a year now. Hasn't been hit. To my knowledge, I don't know if the pole has been hit. Again, the police have reported two accidents in three years, none involving trucks. So it may be a perceived problem more than a real problem. Fair enough. Is there anything else on this item? Thank you, Mr. Coyle. Thank you very much. So I think we are back to our regular agenda. And we are at um, three. Board of Selectmen three. items 3A, vote to ratify proclamations for the Eagle Scouts. We had an additional three names um, that were submitted for the Eagle Scout Court of, Court of Honor on May 19th. Those, site, those proclamations were presented. So is there a motion to ratify the proclamations? I make a motion to uh, ratify the proclamations proclamations for Jonathan Wambach, Nicholas Hernandez, and Matthew Lavalley. 
Is there a second? second? Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, so voted. Also, we have a request to authorize a proclamation for ERA key realty services for the ribbon cutting ceremony at 304 Washington Street. That ribbon cutting ceremony will be held on Thursday, June 6th. 2013, all members have been invited. Is there a motion to authorize the proclamation? Motion to approve the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a motion to approve the uh, proclamation for um, the ribbon cutting ceremony for ERA key realty services. Is there a second? second? Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So voted. And again, all members received an invitation to that event. And this item came in by mail after the agenda was prepared. So we did amend the agenda um, for a ribbon cutting and open house for ReadyMed, which is opening on Thursday, June 6, 2013. And they are having an open house from 5.30 to 7. All members of the board have been invited. Is there a motion to authorize a proclamation for ReadyMed? Make a motion that we vote to authorize proclamation for ReadyMed. Is there, is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? So voted. Next item we have our member items, and we have an update on the closed caption. Mrs. Brotherton. How'd you know that was me? <laughs> Wild guess. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm really going out there for a request again uh, to the Auburn residents in the community. Um, this closed captioning is very close by, is very close by. Um, unfortunately, we need, we need to show numbers. So if there are any residents out there that are aware of someone that would benefit of the closed captioning of these meetings, um, please give the town hall a call and ask for the town manager's office or you can talk to one of the girls and please get us the numbers so that we can advocate for them and get this project moving and done with. Thank you. Is it in regards to this one? I just want to be sure Mrs. Brotherton is finished. Yes. Okay. Mr. Simonian, did you have a member item? Nope, not a member oh. item, just a, a comment. I was wondering if we, would, if we could put a uh, some sort of sign-up sheet or list at the senior center. I, I'm, there may be some folks who could just, okay. it, it would be easier to just put their name on a list up there um, rather than make a phone call or send an email. So okay. if you could do okay. something like that. Thank you, Mr. Simone. Sure. We did put one up once before, so I'm just hoping, and we did get a response up there, I believe two responses. So if we could try that again, that would be great. Thank you for bringing that up. Sure. Okay. Are there any other member items? Seeing none, we have completed the town manager items. Oh. We have no tabled item. Is there any additional public comment? We have the minutes of October 2nd, 2012. Are there any corrections or omissions? Hearing none, the chair will accept them as written. Is there a motion regarding executive session? Make a motion. We. Um Go into executive session in accordance with Mass General Laws, Chapter 30A, Section 21A, to deliberate upon matters which, if done in an open meeting, could detrimentally affect the position of the town regarding strategy with respect to collective bargaining and non union contract negotiations to come out of executive session only to adjourn. Second. This is a roll call vote. Mr. Holstrom? Yes. Mrs. Brotherton? Yes. Mr. Simonian? Yes. Mr. Grossman? Yes. And the chair votes yes.